In the idiot justice system, humanity is represented by two separate but equally important groups. Fake name Tesla fanboys, who typically just channel propaganda from Tesla and by extension Electric Jesus, and those of us who rely on facts to interpret reality. These are their stories. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars for cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, I recently did that report on the woman who's been charged with four serious offences following a crash in a Tesla that cleaned up a pedestrian. And she allegedly claimed that the vehicle was on autopilot at the time of the collision. She allegedly fled the scene and returned later and gave herself into the cops. And generally, it's a bit of a shit show. No determination about guilt or innocence has been made at this stage. The whole thing is before the court, so I'm disinclined to speculate about that. But there was an eruption in the comments from Tesla fanboys, who are a favourite group of mine because of their detachment from reality, let's put it that way, kindly. And I thought we might just canvas some of that because there's some interesting slash hilarious things that come up as a result of that. Now, I'll put a link kind of up there to that initial report if you'd like to see it in case you think perhaps I might have been a little harsh on Electric Jesus and his autopilot, but I'm not changing on that one, so just brace for impact if you're part of the cult. Anyway, here's the first comment from a dude whose name is Get Real. What you fail to realise and convey to your viewers is that people who use autopilot or full self-driving beta responsibly are safer than people driving themselves. This improved safety, of course, translates to making others around the car safer as well. The data is showing this. No, it's not. Your advice at the end warning drivers to pay attention is good, so I'll give you that. But you really do people a disservice when you make it sound like Tesla's driver assist system is dangerous to use. It is the exact opposite that is true. That's from Get Real. Thank you very much for your contribution. I all get. Tesla fanboys, of course, are endlessly entertaining because, in fact, the only people who claim that autopilot makes driving safer are at Tesla, Right? Tesla's claim is that autopilot makes driving safer. Nobody else credible seems to be claiming this, or nobody credible seems to be claiming this. And anybody who takes an opposing view is suffering like a serious deficit of rational thought. And I'm not saying autopilot makes driving more dangerous. What I'm actually saying is that it's a bad name for technology that doesn't actually take over the driving process. It's not automation. It's not full autonomous driving. You've got to be kidding. And yet the name, when you're not a technically trained person and you just buy the car, if it comes with a system called autopilot, you are likely to infer that the system is far more capable than in fact it is. And therefore, you are likely to goof off way too much. And that's a problem. And incidentally, the European Union agrees with me on this. They've banned the name autopilot for Tesla's sold in that market. At least that's my understanding. So I'm not the only person, incidentally, who thinks that the data is not yet in in relation to the safety or otherwise of Tesla's autopilot system. On the 8th of June 2022, which is about nine months ago, so reasonably contemporary. The New York Times ran a story titled How Safe Are Systems Like Tesla's Autopilot? No One Knows. That's not inflammatory, right? It's not. No one knows. The intro says automakers and technology companies say they are making driving safer, but verifying these claims is difficult. That's not inflammatory either. It's just saying that the data is not yet in. And they interviewed a whole bunch of luminaries, right? 
here's a here's a selection of exactly what people told the New York Times. The first one is J. Christian Gerdes, who is a professor of mechanical engineering and co-director of Stanford University's Center for Automotive Research, and a bloke who was also the first chief innovation officer for the U.S. Department of Transportation. So I'd say that he was impeccably credentialed to comment. He said, quote, there is a lack of data that would give the public confidence that these systems as deployed live up to their expected safety benefits. He didn't say they don't live up to the benefits. He said the data's not in yet. Nobody knows. A recent study, this is from the New York Times still, everything I'm going to quote is New York Times from that story. A recent study from the Virginia Transportation Research Council, which is an arm of the Virginia Department of Transportation, shows that these reports from Electric Jesus are not what they seem. And now there's a guy here from that council. His name is Noah Goodall. He's a researcher at the council who explores safety and operational issues surrounding autonomous vehicles. He said, quote, we know that cars using autopilot are crashing less often than when autopilot is not used, but are they being driven in the same way on the same roads at the same time of day by the same drivers? That's kind of important. Mr Goodall is opening the door to a really important concept, which is experimental control. If you're going to run an experiment, you have to keep everything else constant and only vary the thing that you're trying to test. And what he's saying is that the data is not experimentally controlled in this way because there's no analysis of the nature of the driving, the roads, the time of day, and the nature of the drivers. And without that, you can't make conclusions about whether autopilot is safer or not. And anybody who does, frankly, in my estimation, is bullshitting you for that reason. Because if you've got bad data that's not controlled, then your conclusions are going to be bullshit. That's how science works, right? The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety now, the New York Times says that analysing police and insurance data, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, which is a big deal, they've got deep pockets, they're a not-in-profit research organisation funded by the insurance industry in the United States, they found that older technologies like autonomous emergency braking and lane departure warning have improved safety. But the Insurance Institute says... Studies have not yet shown that driver assistance systems provide similar benefits. So they can't find the data that substantiates these claims either. And they're a particularly well-funded organisation because insurance companies have skin in the game. They have skin in the safety game and they've got, therefore, money to contribute to research of this nature. Now, finally, uh, on the other side of this debate is a lawyer... He's a professor. His name's Matthew Wansley at the Cardozo School of New York of Law in New York. Get it right. He specialises in emerging automotive technologies and was previously the general counsel at an autonomous vehicle startup company called Newtonomy. He says, my big worry is that we will have detailed data on crashes involving these technologies without comparable data on crashes involving conventional cars. It could potentially look like these systems are a lot less safe than they really are. So he's erring on the side of they're more safe, but we don't know because we don't have good data. That's the current state of play with autopilot, okay? And technologies like that from other car makers. Nobody knows if they're safer or not. And everything else is just bullshit marketing. The next guy I want to talk to, he's really good. I don't know if this is a real name or not, but it's Jesus Romero. There you go. He says, quote, Cadogan from the 19th century, if you had been there, you would have sent Galileo to burn in fire. We'll get to that. Shall we talk about the number of deaths on the road by human idiot drivers? The autopilot must still be supervised at this point, so it has been human fault as always. Okay, this is kind of interesting because Galileo 
is one of my all-time heroes. He really is. He's Galileo Rocks. He's been dead for quite a while now. He's the father of engineering, at least the father of modern engineering. He laid the foundations for Newton's law of universal gravitation and Einstein and Hawking are both effusive about Galileo's contribution to this and that. Galileo's a big deal, in other words, and he should be someone that more people know more about because he's a badass motherfucker as well, in my view. That's a compliment. He was pivotal on kinematics and the strength of materials. Like, these things weren't formalised when he was alive. Like, you go to engineering school and in mechanical engineering, kinematics, strength of materials, stresses inside materials, that's all you study. That's it. He's the father of that. So every time you get in a car and every time you go in a lift, every time you see a crane putting a building up or every time you see a bridge not fucking collapsing, there's a little piece of Galileo inside all of that shit. And that's why scientific literacy should be more of a focus for our society, I'd suggest. Without Galileo, right, Principia Mathematica, would not have been published, or it may have been published, but not for <laughs> several hundred years more. And that means that this absolutely privileged life that you live and which I live and which we take for granted would be very different, much more dark ages without Galileo, okay? On privilege. Privilege is a term that's been hijacked. It's been hijacked by the woke. It's about white privilege and male privilege, both of which I apparently have in spades, you know. That's, hopefully that's not a derogatory way to put it. But privilege, the privilege I'm talking about is the liberation from back-breaking labour just to feed yourself because that's what it's been like to be a human for the vast majority of human history without the contribution of dudes like Galileo, that's what it would still be like. So Galileo is a big deal. Like, we've been liberated from having to do this labour. In the modern world, we think nothing of getting on a plane and 24 hours later from Sydney, you could be in Rome or you could be in uh, London, any of these places. We take that for granted. We take for granted the ability to just walk out the door and get in our cars and go 200 k's without doing any significant logistic planning, right? It hasn't been like this for most of human history. We live at a particularly privileged time, I'd suggest, and Galileo is part of the reason. Now, to <laughs> Jesus' comments specifically, if I had been there in the 19th century, Jesus, Galileo's give a fuck tank would have been on E, I'd suggest, about my decision to put him in the fire because he died on the 6th of January, 1642. Coincidentally, the same year uh, Isaac Newton was born, at least in the Julian calendar. In other words, he died two centuries earlier. You wombat, you wombat. So I, d I doubt he'd care if, at that stage if I'd decided to put him in the fire because, you know, two centuries is a long time to be dead. That's, a, that's time for you to give a fuck tank to empty, I suggest. Now, also, Galileo was not burned. He was in trouble, but he was never burned. In fact, he died of old age at the age of 77 at home. So there's that. But, you know, in my view, the reason I'm talking about this is mainly because Galileo is a hero. He's like Marvel Avengers superhero-ness, emblematic of that. He is that level of superhero. Move over frickin' Iron Man because Galileo is better than you, Mr. Star. And the reason is not because of all of these contributions that he made to engineering and telescopes and thermometers. He even invented this brilliant compass that was used for military gunnery, right? Like he was a very highly skilled practical engineer. He stood up for what was right. In fact, he was the world's emblematic champion of the facts, the facts versus authority. He came down on the side of the facts. So what did Galileo do, right? He... He picked up his telescope 
and he had a look at bodies moving in the heavens. <laughs> Just for complete disambiguation. The heavens is not some sleazy nightclub in Florence, right? It was the shiny shit moving through the sky at night, i.e. the planets. And he deduced, by virtue of direct observation of the motion of the planets in the sky with the telescope and numerical analysis of those observations, he deduced that the planets rotate around the sun. That's not something that many of us go, oh, holy shit, Batman, that's a big deal. But back then, kind of was, because there was no separation of church and state back then in Italy. The church was essentially the government. It was like a government off its meds being run by 100 EDR mins who all believed in a fairy in the sky. But it was a much more serious level of belief than there is today, okay? And he got, Galileo got Pope Urban VIII massively offside with his claim that the planets rotate around the sun because it really, really, really suited the God-botherers to believe that the Earth was the centre of the universe. And that way, the Sky Fairy could look down at his creation in the centre of the universe and, you know, love us all to death and then hoover us up to heaven, except for the ones who, you know, focused a little bit too hard on Narelle next door and her boobies kind of thing. It, it made much less sense to those in power if we weren't in the centre of everything, and that was the crux of their disagreement with Galileo's findings, meaning reality. And he got in big trouble for that, and by big trouble, I mean... He was subject to the Inquisition. Like I said, no separation of church and state. The Inquisition was like a precursor to a modern trial with a judge and a jury, except no jury, and God was the judge, interpreted by a whole bunch of, I'd have to say, fairly mean-spirited dudes who looked for a reason to, you know, put you to death and things of that nature. So this was the world in which Galileo found himself prosecuting the facts, right? The Inquisition found that he was, quote, vehemently suspected of heresy. He wasn't convicted of heresy. He was just vehemently suspected of heresy. And this was crime enough to be, quote, imprisoned at the pleasure of the Inquisition. Okay? This is like a a bad, this is a nightmare in the context of the way we live, where you can have a shot at just about anything without getting you know, imprisoned for the rest of your life. His sentence was commuted the very next day to house arrest for the rest of his life, which meant effectively the next 10 years. So he championed the facts and he got thrown away under house arrest for a decade. Okay. His book was also banned. It was called Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, as was the publication of anything that he would write in the future while under house arrest. So they wanted to lock him away and shut him up because he came up with a better version of reality. Like, this is what science does. Science has a look at reality and comes up with a model and says, well, reality appears to behave in this way. This is the best model we've got. And then some brainiac improves on the model and science goes, yeah, okay, no problem. Yeah, that's great. Approved. We'll go with that now. This is exactly what happened when Einstein took a look at Newton's theories of motion and then went, well, what happens when you go really, really fast? And they just, he just adapted Newton. And if you go back and move really, really slowly, then Einstein becomes Newton in terms of the theory that's accepted, for example. Okay, so Galileo just did what science has done for the past, I don't know, 500 years, and yet house arrest was the price he paid for that, which kind of sucks. So what did he do while he was in house arrest? He spent a whole bunch of time revisiting his earlier work and essentially writing the first textbooks on kinematics and the strength of material, thereby cementing his position as the father of modern engineering, which you take for granted every time you get in a car or ride a push bike or walk up a set of stairs or get in a lift or get in a plane or get on a boat and you come out the other side of any of those processes still alive. And the thing that galls me 
beyond all else about all of this, the injustice to Big G and all of this stuff, is that it took the church, like the God botherers took a full 360 years to finally formally declare that they had erred in condemning Big G for telling us all that the earth rotates around the sun. That kind of sucks. In fact, on the 31st of October in 1992, this is like from the 17th century to October 92. You've got to be kidding. Pope John Paul II said that the theologians who condemned Galileo did not recognise the formal distinction between the Bible and its interpretation. And I'd suggest that as grovelling, sincere apologies go, that sucks. It's not enough. This is essentially my problem with much of religion is because every time science understands reality at a deeper level, there's less gap to fill between what we understand and what we don't understand. Back in the olden days, there's a big gap. People didn't understand what clouds were. No one flew through the clouds. No one understand anything about what causes diseases or the weather and things of this nature. So we invented all kinds of gods. Oh, God must be unhappy. That's Thor up in the sky creating the thunder. He's the god of thunder kind of thing. And when a ship gets taken by an angry ocean, that's Poseidon having a hissy fit kind of thing. Every time you understand more about reality, there's less spack for God to fill kind of thing. So anyway, why am I talking to you about this on an otherwise mundane automotive YouTube channel. And the reason is because I can't think of a time, any other time in the past 100, I don't know, 23 years, let's say, back to 1900, where the facts have been under greater ongoing assault than they are today. The epistemology of reality is really under a set of, ongoing attacks, continued assault from this business about the internet weaponizing uninformed opinion, right? People's confirmation biases. It's okay. You can just say, if you say often enough that autopilot is safer than a human driver, hopefully that'll make it true, but might, might make it true in the, in the epistemology it might be a belief in the domain of epistemology, but in the domain of effect, objective facts, we don't know, for example. And there's all of these things of this nature that assault everyone. It's very difficult to get to cold, hard facts. What is the bedrock of reality because of this continued assault on the facts by everyone who just finds the facts inconvenient? In our world... Right? Some of us actually stand up for the facts. We'd like to know what the facts are so we can stand up for them. And this is what I try and do with you as a consumer trying to interpret the automotive industry. Right? My mission is sort of audaciously to stick up for you by calling out what I would describe as anti-consumer corporate cockheadism in the car industry, and I'd suggest that you should attempt wherever possible to stick up for the facts also. And you don't need the courage to withstand an inquisition. You don't need to worry about being condemned for suspicion of heresy, vehement suspicion of heresy, right? You're not going to spend the next 10 years under house arrest before you go blind and just croak from old age, which is what happened to Galileo, right? All you have to do, really, is stump up the courage to be a little bit disliked by some other people for defending reality. And having done this, I've, like I've crossed this bridge, I don't ever think anymore about what's someone going to think of me if I say that? Like, it's irrelevant, dude. The worst that can happen is someone's not going to like you for just telling them that reality is this way and they're wrong, okay? Having crossed this bridge, I'd suggest you should try it because ultimately it's incredibly liberating. <laughs>